This is Makona! We are looking at the early age Macone brazen giants. You can call them Macone, Macone. I don't really care how you call them. Either way, they're the Spartans. You can imagine, here's Gerard Butler. Wait, hold on, never mind. But what we're doing is we're dealing with an early age race of exalted giants from coming down from an ancient god. These are basically titans in the classic titans versus gods battle. And these guys are running around kicking everyone's butt without having any sacred troops. That's kind of the shtick here. If you look through the commanders, stouts, they're cheap, nothing special. This commander, I don't see a purpose for this guy at all other than ferrying around troops if you need something really cheap great commanders cheap researcher very easy old but with the high hit points the old isn't really that bad for us e-force very very important to the nation you will need to suppress their once a year in the fall i think it's turn six or seven it'll start causing unrest in your forts and if you have one of these guys it'll suppress it archon very good battle mage you get plus two to one of these paths so you either get a three fire or three earth that's a really good battle mage for you and these guys are not old Marks, very powerful, very good unit leaders, as well as very good self-thuggers. You can abuse these guys for quite a few things. Problem is, they can't bless themselves. Elder Cyclops, my favorite super combatant and thug chassis. These guys are also great at forging. Focus on the resource bonus to be able to pump out more of your hoplites in your main province. And Master Smithing, we really want those dwarven hammers to be able to crank this out. Basilius, I don't like them. They're old, they're poorly armored, they're kind of the worst of all worlds because an Archon's going to be a better battle caster. However, they are your only source of water. Water, you can get up to water two. Sometimes if you're super lucky, water three. And priest two, when you're in an inquisitor, it's treated as double. So it's like a priest four. This gentleman's very good at dom pushing and fighting. If you need them, you need them. They fit a small niche, which I like, but otherwise I don't tend to recruit these guys. Now, when you're looking at your troops, I don't pay attention to a lot of these middle troops. I care about two major troops. This is one way I play the nation, where if I'm fighting a bunch of not heavily armored, like super lightly armored nations that don't have really good protection right off the bat, I like to swarm them with javelins because these trade very efficiently. They're only eight gold per troop, very, very cheap, and they can get promoted. So these guys come and throw spears and javelins at people and fight very well for very cheap. That's good against very low protection enemies. However, if you're against something like Abyssia or anybody with higher protection, I like my hoplites with the 21 protection but super early game i like the ectromos with the 16 protection because that's enough for expansion and then as i get my resources built up through these gentlemen in my home province and grabbing my cap circle i slowly upgrade from seven of these a turn to seven of these a turn you look here increases recruitment limit of the hoplites and the ectromos per turn thank goodness because otherwise we'd be screwed and the forge gives us these guys and produces 150 resources so you start off with quite a bit you have a conflict bonus you're good at suppressing enemy dominion that's excellent take advantage of that because you really don't want to be fighting an enemy dominion you get a bonus Bonus to order, thank goodness, because otherwise you would have trouble fighting off the unrest that your forts naturally create. Let's go into, take a look at this image of your national summons. I'm going to pull it up now. Your national summons, you have a Hound of Twilight, Conjuration 5, tough to get to. It has fear, good bites, and a tail, but it's very hard for you to cast this spell. I don't really know if I would focus on this guy too much. Very neat to look at, cool unit, but just nothing I would really focus on. Cur or care, whatever you want to say. They have fear, they're stealthy. That's one of the tricks there, is they're your only real access to good stealthy troops but they increase unrest which is already a problem for you and they're ethereal and invisible which is nice it makes them very difficult to deal with but with magic support they're going to wipe you out pretty quickly sparta or sparte they're phenomenal they are great troops if you put buffs on them they will take people out they will handle a lot of problems for you they have spirit sight so if you're getting hit with darkness very 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 effective to ha add these guys to your forces very helpful with their formation fighter being able to fill in the gaps for you and help out a lot because that formation fighter will stack with somebody else with formation fighter like your hoplites who would have thought the nation based on sparta works really well with sparte the calcatoros this bull uh, it's a bit expensive i don't like it for what it gives you it gives you a lot of protection a lot of hit points and fiery breath and a lot of resistances and a heat aura i mean you already have a lot of protection you have a lot of hit points i mean it's okay but i wouldn't focus on it the lamp pads zero protection but they are invulnerable to normal weapons i still don't trust the invulnerability of only 15 their bane fire torch will hit an 
AoE 1, if I'm not mistaken, and decay people. So it's an option to take out thugs or similar things like that. But we have plenty of ways to handle thugs anyway. Let's go take a look at what I designed for a pretender. I have two versions of the Pretender. I'm going to show you one here. I call it Late Game Flexible Sorcery, the Demi Lich. I gave him two Earth. I gave him six Astral, four Death, three Nature, three Glamour, and three Blood. The reason I did this is we have a... In fact, I would say Makone is notorious for not having Sorcery Paths. Sorcery Paths to the new players out there being, of course, Astral, Death, Nature, Glamour, Blood. We have no access to those Spell Paths. So I like this Pretender because he gives me access to all those Spell Paths, at least to a minor degree. And Astral, which is in my opinion, is one of the most powerful spell paths because it's the most versatile. The best part about Astral is it gives you access to a lot of anti-global spells, such as Dispel, Disenchantment, which is the more powerful spell. And it also gives your armies, if you ever try to bring this guy into battle by warping him in or something, it can give you anti-magic. It also gives you access to really good magic items. I'm going to say the reason we aim all of our Order 3 Productivity 2, I went with Heat because it's very easy for Fire Mages to cast Heat Resist spells, like Fire Resistance spells. So I figure any hit me with heat from hell or something that can heat me up and tire me out or hit me with low damage fire spells I can protect my armies from it growth I just like the points I spent it on growth I don't I don't obsess with growth on Dominion 6 like I did on 5 but I like it when I can get it I took misfortune 1 because with order 3 we're not really going to be suffering from that at all and magic 2 because I really like being able to increase my research on this nation it helps a lot we scale really hard with magical research now for the bless I took reinvigoration this is very 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 important for your mages that's the one big thing Kona is going to suffer against is fatigue plays because all of your hoplites have your heavily armored hoplites have seven encumbrance and your thugs are going to benefit from this as well. Your super combatants won't because the cyclopes aren't sacred, but your thugs will and your mages will. I like that. Low light vision. I took just in case they pulled any darkness plays. This allows my mages to still be fairly effective. I took poison resistance for no reason other than foul vapors. Plinking at people is very annoying. Unaging. Although unaging works on most of your troops, your E4s and I think one other of your mages they have a tag on them that makes sure that they gain extra age no matter what even if you take unaging however i did experimentation and i found that still 50 percent of them are young when you do this so you still get 50 percent old but instead of 100 percent old that's kind of nice and then strong blood just to give a little extra poison resistance and more disease resistance primarily the poison resistance is because we have access to earth which gives us lightning resist we have access to fire which gives us fire resist and some cold resist poison resist is the one thing we don't have good access to on our armies so it's nice having 10 poison resist on our sacred commanders. That's virtually it. Let's go check out the other pretender I designed. This gentleman I called the disease curing troop leader. I made him. This is a little easier for beginners to play with as opposed to worrying about the poison late game, worrying about foul vapors, that sort of thing. This gentleman still has six astral access, good water and fire and earth, but those are all paths you already have just solid. But he took, I took a disease healer because instead of taking unaging, which still leaves us 50% old guys, now we just have a pretender that can heal diseases right off the bat. So he can just stand in his home province. He can inspire people to research better and he can cure diseases and fight off some of the misfortune events. And then we still got the reinvigoration that I think is core on this nation. And I took two times inspirational presence because it makes it so your slaves, when they're led by a taskmaster, essentially your taskmasters are plus two morale to slaves. This makes it plus four. And your your commanders on early age McCone, if you look at these gentlemen, the cheap researchers we can get, they only have a leadership of 50, but they have a good squad morale bonus up to three squads. They can do line formations. So what taking inspirational presence twice does is that raises this leadership up to 150 on these guys. And now you have a really cheap research mage who can also double as a troop leader, which makes it very nice. It gives me a lot of versatility. Those are the pretenders I chose to go with. And now I'm going to pull up on the screen a couple of the reasons why I took Astral 6. Now you can see I pulled up. We'll start in the top left. Disenchantment is a more powerful version of Dispel. I love it because when other people are trying to hit me with globals and other things, I can lock them out of it by blocking them. I also like teleport item and teleport gems. This is more particular to my undead chassis with the flexible sorcery because the Demi Lich can't move that easily, but if he can teleport items and teleport gems, with my thugging and super combatant work, it's very important to switch out your items based on the army you're facing. So this is very helpful enabling my guy. Just kind of a side note, I know a lot of people don't use these. I do. They're very helpful to get units. If you're fighting against somebody who brings, you know, lightning damage as a counter and then you teleport an item to your thug that gives them 15 
15 lightning resist, all of a sudden those people aren't that fancy. Mind hunt, I brought up mind hunt less as something that you want to use and more so you can see the numbers here. Astral core detection chance of 40%. If you don't have at least level three astral and somebody starts mind hunting for you, you won't be able to guarantee you kill them. But if somebody starts mind hunting and you have level three astral or higher on your pretender, you'll at least be able to kill them before they can start mind hunting and killing you. Golems are a wonderful summon. I put golem construction up here in the top right as well. Summon golems. This gives you access to level two astral commanders that basically aren't leaders whatsoever. But what they can do is they are very durable. They're very tanky and they're very good at casting spells, especially for a mindless unit, which makes them resistant to a lot of the problems that a lot of people bring against astral troops. Then we have arcane decree. This is great to take over global enchantments. Astral spells are always really good with global enchantments. And this is part of the reason why reduces global enchantments into spells mites by half of the arcane decrees might. So you overcast this thing, you really make it hard for people to cast anything. Arcane Nexus, if you pull this off, you basically won the game. It's a good it's a good end game because you need an end game with Makona and you don't have, Makona doesn't really have a great sorcery access. So if you're gonna give sorcery access to only your pretender, he might as well take advantage of it with something like this. Anti-Magic, if your pretender is the mobile one, he can come into battle a lot more often and cast Anti-Magic for your troops. This helps a lot. You could also do it by summoning a Golem, which would be much safer. But if you decide to go the route of putting Thug or Super combatant items on your pretender and bringing him around, hey, this will benefit you. Akashic Knowledge. I like to use this on throne provinces. Throne provinces tend to have, especially if they're on like a mountain or something that has extra magic sites, this knowledge will detect every single type of magic path you could guess there, except glamour it shows here. It doesn't show glamour here, but I'm assuming that's just an oversight on the mod inspector. It lets you find all magical sites in a given province, and that really is worth the 25 gems if you find four or five sites on a throne province. I wouldn't cast it anywhere else, but it's just something to consider and the range is huge so you don't have to even be close arcane analysis is great and especially when combined with disenchantment it helps you dispel everyone else's globals those are good astral things you can do and now i'm going to pull up magic items that we can forge and the reason we like to have nature on the demi lich and astral for our things here are a couple simple items i know again i'm aiming this for super beginners shield of gleaming gold you get for cheap but it requires glamour you would need to cast this or forge this with your demi lich which makes it a little difficult something to mention here because it gets a national discount for us so it's a little cheaper to forge so if you do actually get glamour access that's a good way to do it ring of fire i didn't bring up as a particular core item i just wanted to point out that for only if you build a dwarven hammer this thing only costs you three gems to give one of your thugs or super combatants 15 fire resistance there's the same one i showed up in the top right of the ring of tamed lightning gives you 15 shock resistance there's one for cold with the water ring there's all sorts of these little five gem items that you can drop to three gem items with this dwarven hammer here it makes it very nice boots of grasping earth it's a little expensive for me. I don't really like how expensive it is, but it does the same thing as essentially Vine Shield. Now, the way they've redesigned these boots and shields is that now it just hits people around them every turn. And having Boots of Grasping Earth and a Vine Shield at the same time on a guy essentially makes it so nobody can attack them every turn. They're all just stuck and standing there. Dragon Helmet's a good early game fire helmet that any of your mages can easily forge. So is Fire Plate. If you're facing Abyssia or somebody with a lot of heat, these are great items to throw on. Also just great for anyone that needs a morale boost. Light Lightless Lanterns, phenomenal way to get your research snowballed. Highly, highly recommend Lightless Lanterns. Vine Shield, again, good for thugs and super combatants. Slave Matrix, these are great. So a Slave Matrix and the Sky Metal Matrix here is why it's really good to have Earth and Astral on somebody in your nation because even though we don't have good access to communions because we don't have Astral, we now can do communions as long as we forge those items. This is a huge way to give yourself more sorcery magic late game than you'd otherwise think possible. But a couple normal cheat mages you get, you know, in a province. Heck, if if you find lizard shamans, you could just have them cast communion slave and then make any ma master you want out of any mage you want who doesn't need astral magic. Very, very powerful items. Gives you a really powerful late game ability to scale your spell casting. Thunder Whip. I just wanted to bring this up because this weapon is hilarious. It has an extra effect, not on damage, not on hit, just an extra effect of AoE 1 of chaining lightning damage. If people are facing you and you're wielding two of these, your attack score will go down to virtually nothing, but your area of effect attack will hit every round from both weapons no matter what. So it's very nice. If you're facing people with no lightning resist on their base troops, one of your thugs can sit there with armor and this blind in the dark, doesn't matter. And he will hit, 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 and just thump everyone around him with lightning damage. It's hilarious to watch. Highly recommend trying it out once or twice. Boots of the Messenger. It, your Demi Lich will have access to forging this. It's good reinvigoration for boots. Something to consider. Ring of Regeneration. Obvious for any thug or super combatant. The Horror Helmet. Amazing to get on the Demi Lich because all of your thugs and super combatants now have fear. The God Slayer Spear is something that you 
can forge as Makone, and it's very powerful if you're facing, if somebody's trying to respond to your thugs or super combatants with sacreds, this weapon will handle that problem for you. Elemental armor, we get a national discount on it, and it's great for giving your thugs or super combatants just a really good generic armor, but it's a bit on the expensive side, but with our discount, it actually comes down quite nicely. Now let's go take a look at expansion, now that you guys have a really basic understanding of what's going on here. But before that, I want to summarize for you guys, basically. We're dealing with a lot of very good troops, so we're using our pretender to get us into different magic paths for different forging, for different spells, similar things like that. We really don't want to have no answer late game. Early game, you will have a lot of power, and you need to abuse it as quickly as you can. And you'll see during our expansion that it's very, very, very fast, like faster than you would guess how fast you can bring yourself online and get yourself rolling. All right, and here we go, guys. Now, this is the start that I recommended for beginner beginners with the tender that gave us the inspiration. Makes it a little easier just to ensure you don't route early game. So now, since I had a couple comments about beginner beginners playing this game and being kind of clueless as to even how to operate a turn, I'm going to go very slow through my first turn, show everything I do. So as soon as I get into the game, in general, what I do is I take a look at my commander. Is he strong enough to avoid getting plinked out by a standard arrow in early battles? Obviously, 32 hit points, 21 protection. 24 head protection, even more important. Able to defend himself a little bit. Taskmaster, he is a solid prophet. So I would make him the prophet because turn one in Dominion 6, you generally don't want to blind expand because all of the troops around you are buffed from Dominions 5. My scout, here's what I would do. Go to army setup. The way you get to army setup is by hitting T up here. The little hot keys, trust me, you need to learn them. Hit T to get an army setup. Take a look at your scout. Put him way in the back. This is the front of the battle. This is the back of the battle. Set his orders to retreat. You can either hit R, which is a quick hotkey for that, or you can click here and select retreat. This will make sure your scout will run into a combat and immediately run away and hopefully survive. Sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. Now, as a new player, if you right click on these provinces, terrain planes, and you hover over it, you'll see at the very bottom of your screen down here, there's nothing in terms of bonuses or penalties. If you look at Rot Marsh, Swamp, very low income, hinders movement, but more magic sites. That does not seem like something you want turn one because you're not going to be site searching for magic sites turn one, right? So we would not want to prioritize this province to get here. This one maybe because it's neutral. This one definitely not. Also provinces like swamps tend to have necromancers and undead and all sorts of trouble. Check out this new one up here. Plains, no bonuses or penalties. Nardago, plains, despite the image is just plain. So we are surrounded by three plains provinces, which is fairly unlucky for us, but we'll take it. We don't care. So pick one of the plains provinces. I like the image of this one. So I'm going to send my scout over here. If you left click, he will sneak. However, if you hold control and left click, he will attack. He will move and attack. That's what you want. And the reason is, again, he's retreating. The reason we do that is because a scout will give you great knowledge on what they have, but a scout attacking and running away, if he survives, will give you perfect knowledge. After that, I go left to right. Recruit next. What do I want to recruit? There are several ways you can recruit. In Makone, you can take advantage of the cheap Pell tasks you have. They're not as cheap as these, however. If you look at the Pell tasks to the right of them, slaves, they can promote moat after a couple battles and they're even cheaper so you can get a whole bunch of these now this is personal preference somewhat but it's also who you're against if you're against somebody that doesn't have a lot of shields or a lot of armor in early age which is kind of common then recruiting a lot of the helot pell tasks and taking them out with a taskmaster like our future prophet for example you will be just fine because these javelins are extremely efficient in terms of economy throwing those javelins wipes out a lot of troops that otherwise might cause you trouble. That being said, if you want a more generic start that works virtually against everybody, the two versions of Hoplites and Ectromos over here, these guys are the lighter armored ones. They skirmish, formation fighter. These guys don't skirmish, but they're a formation fighter. That really only comes into play later if you want them skirmishing so they can avoid, like with sparse line and similar things, they can avoid getting evocation down. But my primary goal is to get as many of these Hoplites here as possible. As you can see with our scales, we have a lot of resources. However, you can build up to seven a month of this, seven a month of this, or seven of both. So one thing I like to do is start buying them and see how many I would get. Oh, we get stopped at four. How many do we get with these? Four, five, six. We would get six of these gentlemen. Now these are usually strong enough to expand as well. So what I like to do early game is instead of focusing on the super heavily armored 21, 24 guys, I focus on the 16, 24, 14 guys because they're just as protected from arrow head hits, but they're just a little less protected, but they have less in 
four, I believe seven. Yeah, seven encumbrance. So when you are early in the game and you're not going to have a lot of troops, encumbrance plays a much higher role because these troops are going to be fighting for longer on average. So turn one, I like to recruit as many of these as I can. And if you, as a new player, recruit something that you can't afford because of resources, for example, but you hit repeat, that means the excess resources here, the excess 11, will be applied towards this guy's cost next turn, effectively giving you more resources. Let's take a look. We already have our scout, a commander. We have our troop leaders. We have Gerontes, our chief researchers, the E4s. We know we need an E4 in every province or every fortification we have because otherwise that once a year battle that we have in our forted provinces will cause us a lot of unrest and cause us a problem. You can read it. Each autumn, the four I declare war upon the Helots to stifle unrest and take out troublesome Helots or Helotes. They are very good to have at least one in every province. So I like to start off with one of these guys. That way I just don't have to think about it anymore and we're good to go. So we've spent all of our commander points. We don't really need to worry about holy points on this nation. We've spent all of our resources, most of our gold. So now that we're done with that, take a look. Bid for mercenaries. If you want to in a multiplayer game, you can bid for some mercenaries. I don't recommend it because your troops early game are ridiculously strong and it feels very good to run around with just what you have. Next, you can read province chronicles. None of that matters. Read messages. If any of these messages come out, turn two, that would be more important. Send messages, national overview, score graphs, hall of fame, tenders of the world. You can take a look at what you're against. I have set this up for an expansion specifically, so I have a bunch of human nations so they don't get in the way of the expansion. Otherwise, you want to look at what you're facing and try and prioritize. If you're facing a bunch of heavily armored nations like Abyssia, you might not want to be spamming out javelinists who will get burned to death. If you're against giants like Hinnom, you might want to stay away from focusing on super combatants and thugging too much because Hinnom's troops are strong enough to just punch through your thugs' basic protection regardless. If you're against Kalem, thugging would be great. Baratos could go either way. Depends on their research. And Relay. Everybody hates Relay. We don't talk about Relay. Nobody talks about the tentacles. So next we get to research. Now what you can look at in general with research is you know our basic nation paths. This is how I dictate research. I look at our basic nation paths. Fire, water, earth. Fire, air, earth. Fire, earth. Fire, earth. You're, you're catching a trend here, right? Fire, earth. So we know fire and earth are very important to us. Earth tends to be a very good school for protection buffs. Now if you look through research and you right click on alteration, which is really good for buffs, and you hit E on your keyboard, it will bring up all earth spells that you get per level. If you hit F, it will bring up all fire spells you get per level. I want you to hit E and take a look. If we get level two, we get personal stone skin, which protects our mages from getting plinked off or sniped by something. We also get personal iron skin at level three. These are both very good to give to our troops and for our super combatants and or thugs. So that's an option. One thing I like to do early game, however, is since early game, I'm not going to be thugging too hard. I like to look at construction because if you look at level two, temper armors, you'll notice early game, most buffs, let me show you an alteration buff. If I wanted to put say stone skin on my troops, it's an area effect of one and it requires level four. That takes a while to get to, right? As a brand new player, you might not notice this stuff. That's why I'm pointing it out. Area of effect one, range only 15, very low range, very small area of effect. You go to construction, temper armors is only level two. All of your troops have armor on all parts. So this grants plus three protection to all armor parts, still a 15 range, but an area of effect of five plus. So you will actually be able to easily with less mages buff more of your troops early game. So I like to rush construction two and even three if I want to be able to construct some magic items. If you look through, so if you click on this, it'll let you see every magic item. These are phenomenal for thugging. I think I talk about them elsewhere in the video. If you ever need to counter thug, this is how you can counter thug. A cheap fire resistant helmet that gives you low light vision is this as well. And this is a good early boost to your research, which you can use on Makone. So I like to start with construction two or three. There's also the option of conjuration, which is good for your mages, which this is why I don't prioritize this. Summon earth power is a phenomenal spell. It's a staple spell for earth mages where they cast it, they gain plus one earth magic bonus and reinvigoration four. That's really good for thugging and spell casting. I don't like to get this early, like super early because I'm not going to be thugging and spell casting in my first year. Well, maybe, but probably probably towards the end of the first year. Enchantment, does it have anything good for earth? Yes, it does. It has strength of giants, which is an area effect one plus four damage essentially on your troops. You also have gift of giant strength, which comes
comes at level three, which gives plus four damage to multiple troops in a larger area of effect. And that's what I'm looking for early game. So new, new, new players, make sure you keep an eye on these areas of effect because early game, you're not going to have 15 mages running around point buffing all of your troops. So you need to have very effective areas of effect on your buffs. So what we're going to do here is we're going to do construction three, be able to unlock these items. Also, this item right here, very, very important to get thugging. So this is really good for us to be able to get to construction three early, not only for the buffs of temper armors, but also to be able to crank out dwarven hammers. Because with a dwarven hammer, if you read carefully, a forge bonus of two essentially means it costs two less gems to forge any item that you forge with one of your mages. That's very important to us since we like thugging and super combatants because it makes items very cheap. This item goes from five air gems down to three. And if you look, your elder cyclops is very good at creating magic items because his master smith treats him as plus one level crafting magic items. So he's treated as three, two, three with a boost, which makes him very good at not only providing you resources for more of your hoplites, which you need, but also forging items for all of your super combatants and thug chassis. So it's a really good early start to get that. You can't always get that. It's a little bit greedy, but in this case for the beginners, we're going to say, let's get that first and let's take a look at enchantment. Let's get some gifts of giant strength and let's check out what fire spells we can also get. Another option you can get here, fire shield. This is very good for thugs cheap thugs. Another good option you can get under alteration is earth meld. Earth meld is very good for this nation because your problem is that you're going to be outnumbered for the most part. Again, area of effect five, so it's phenomenal. Range 25, decent enough, good precision. Your mages will be able to stick enemy units in place. I like being able to hold enemy units in place and break up their formations because then our hoplites chew through them. So next we will get alteration three, and then let's get some damage. Gift of giant strength. There we go. We have set our research up for all of these levels of spells and as we get mages researching it will go a little quicker for us so we can double check we have already recruited a commander and troops we have already set up our research and we have done everything we can possibly do this turn to prepare ourselves you can also check what thrones are here i'm not going to do that because we're not playing a real game and then what you do is you hit end turn up here in the right or e all right here we go on turn two our first battle with our scout remember we sent our scout out to scout for us obviously he's not going to die did he live yep he lived let's go look at exactly what formation they have set up here. So if we pause, we can see they have heavy cavalry that are doing 13. And remember with a lance, they get a charge bonus for the first strike, but it's important to read this because some lances are light and some lances are heavy. This is a light lance. So if you read at the bottom, the bonus damage is limited to half the strength of the charging unit. So five bonus damage. This damage will only get up to 18 on their first strike. And then afterwards it will only be 13. So we really don't have much to worry about except the initial lance charge. And that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's eight initial lance charges we have to worry about. These guys only do 13. These guys are just commanders. They're not mages. So now we know exactly what we want. We want somebody in this province if we're taking it over and we like, okay, let me show you. When you right click on this one, see how it says farmland and river? If you look at the bottom, farmland is high income. River is also high income and it has fewer magic sites. That's great for early game. In addition, up here, farmland and river, high income, high income, low resources, fewer magic sites. This is where we want to beeline for our early game. And I can already tell this random map is going to make it very difficult to expand, but that's okay. I'm going over very, very basic principles for you here. We're going to want to beeline for this province and this province. And now that we've checked out exactly what's here, we know we have eight lance charges we need to eat. If we come back to our province, we hit T to army setup. I'm in here. We now put all of our troops on here and let's take a look. Can he, this right here indicates how many total squads he can have without morale penalties. We can have three squads, so might as well. What do these guys have? Just a spear and their slaves. These guys have a spear and their slaves. It'd be very good to put them all together like that. So now we have a larger group, so they're less likely to to morale route. And now we have a smaller group down here and we can look. Here's an important stat early game. Combat speed is 14. On these guys, combat speed is eight. And on these guys, combat speed is 10. So what you actually might want to do, separate out the faster guys. So now you have the faster guys, slower guys, and much faster guys. And you can do, this is just an example, but line formation of 14 speed, line formation of 12 speed. What was this one? Actually 10 and line formation of say eight speed. So now these guys will all three hit at about the same time. Now what I want to do is set them off to the side slightly so they can get around. But what I really want is I want these guys taking the lance charge first so that they don't have to worry about things. I'm not concerned about their speed difference so much. I'm going to put them together. It doesn't make nearly as much of a difference to me. For your prophet, a general spell he can cast is divine blessing. I just do that because I'm lazy and I don't want to change it later. And word of power. Every level three priest has this level three holy spell after divine blessing. Divine blessing is good because it's the entire battlefield and it blesses sacred troops. We don't have to worry about that on this nation as much. This is your smite. 
essentially your level three smite. It is a spell based upon your pretender's paths. It does something different based on the pretender's paths. When you're in pretender creation, you can hit S to look at spells and take a look at your individual spell. But this is a spell that has 100 precision, 100 range, and will paralyze one person. So we like to spam this out. Now, if you choose a spell and you want to repeat it, you can hit X over and over and it will pop up like that. Now that you've selected all your manual spells, I like to choose advance and cast spells, but only because my commander is big and buff and I don't mind if he advances to kick some butt. We have these guys set on hold and attack. I hit H to get hold and attack. You can do that here as well, hold and attack. And then if you want, you can click on it and select your target. I like to hit the letter C, shift C, I'm sorry, shift C for target, hold and attack closest, hold and attack closest. One thing we can do here is target these guys at the cavalry to make sure they take the lance charge for us. Move our tender, I mean, I'm sorry, our prophet up closer. So he's protected by the troops from getting lance charged. And let's set ourselves to attack these guys. They're ones that we scouted just to be smart. Find the ones that we scouted. Now we're looking around heavy infantry's militias. We don't care about this one nearly as much. Deer tribe, deer tribe archers. We might want to look at stealing this province as well. So I would take our scout and go this way and attack. So he does the same retreat. Now left to right army setup. Now let's recruit. We're still getting these troops. We still have about the same resources. So we look at what we can afford for mages. These guys are a little more expensive. These guys are a little cheaper. These guys are quite a bit more expensive, but much better battle mages. How much gold do we have? We don't have enough for him. We don't want him. We have enough for him and it'll save us a little bit more money so we can hopefully get an elder cyclops next. That's what we're looking for. I love these guys. They give us good mages that are solid at forging, casting spells in battle, and also thugging and super combatant work. So we'll do this. We'll get ourselves a Geronte. Make sure this guy's automatically on research. If he's not, you just click on him and hit shift R or you click on this and click research and we should be good to go. All right, here we are, turn three. We now want to look and see how our battles went. You can look at the quick view, which we obviously know our scout ran away. Did he survive? Yep, he did. And now we can look at exactly what he discovered for us. So we know our formations a little better. Space pauses the battle, by the way, or you can just click up here. Now this is just a bunch of militia, which are virtually non-existent and light infantry, weak damage to us. This is nothing to our hoplites, especially. So this is a very easy province for us to take. Q quits out of the battle. Now let's go see what our battle looks like when we fight. We have already seen this province. That's why we set our Ectromos and our Hoplites down a little lower so they would take the Lance Charge because we don't mind losing one or two of these guys, but we really mind losing any of these guys. So now we're going to see what happens. We're going to see if we can catch the Lance Charge with these guys and then take over and hopefully kill everyone with these guys and these guys. There's our word of power with his summon knocking the guy off his horse because he paralyzed and damaged the horse. Speed this up a little bit. There we go. Perfect. We took the Lance Charge on our hoplites. That's exactly what we wanted. And now we're just working our way through the troops. Yep. Exactly what we wanted. That's a little unfortunate. They retreated into our other Ectromos. But we. this is exactly what we wanted. We might have lost one, two, maybe three. Hit Q to quit. Check out. We lost two of the weaker Ectromos with only 11 protection. We're okay with that. And we lost one Hoplite with 17 protection. We're also okay with that. Let's go to the province. Now that we have it. Personally, my obsession with defense from Dominions 5 is to raise one to six. The reason for this is there are misfortune events that require province defense of five or below before they can happen. Such as is random bandits taking over a poorly defended province, similar things. So if you raise your defense on all your provinces up to at least six, you will skip a lot of the events. There's another event set of events you can skip by going up to 11 because it checks if you're under 10 or not. But early game, I like my goal. So another way to raise defense faster is if you're holding shift and you push up, it goes up by five. That way you don't have to manually click or misclick, etc. Plus this has a nice province defense. Now we're looking at our expensive provinces here. Militias, archers, and heavy infantries for this rich farmland. This one is 160 units of heavy infantry, heavy cavalry, and archers. So let's take our scout, let's go test this theory, see how many people are here for real, and let's take our troops and actually go get that farmland that we wanted up here, because this one looks definitely possible to take. Go back to our base, remember, left to right, army setup. We have our troops here. We should be able to expand with these guys, theoretically, but I want to check if we have better resources yet, and the way you do that is you just remove all these guys. You see one, two, three, four, five. Nope, still can only get four. And now we look at our mages. We can get another Geront and just 
saving up for that Cyclops when you need 465. Get another cheap researcher, and you can always focus on another E4 if you prefer. I just like saving up the gold so I can get over here as soon as possible. This, these gentlemen have good research. I just don't like taking them out. These guys, I will take out to lead an army. In fact, I would even go so far as saying this is not a lot of troops, correct? 20, 30, 46, 46 troops. We might be able to take those out once we have another turn of recruitment of this. So that's when I'll go running over there and taking those guys out. Hit E for end turn, and off we go. Turn four, here we are. Research and construction completed. What spells come available to us? Let's right click on construction, hit E to unselect earth only. Construction of magical trinkets. Now we can start making little trinkets. This is a good useful early trinket for helmets if you need protection. This is a useful armor with moderate encumbrance. This one has a little too much encumbrance for my liking, but it does have much higher protection. Seven extra points is a heck of a lot of points. And these are very, very important. Ring of fire, cheap fire resistance. Ring of lightning, cheap lightning resistance. And ring of cold frost, cheap cold resistance. Very important for your thugs if you're running around against particular types of enemies and cheap poison resistance as well as a spell. Our scout here found out that, yep, they actually do have 107 troops. Let's take a look at what they're dealing with here in this other farmland because it might be a little more brutal to take. Quite a bit of heavy cavalry, good defense, solid protection, charge bonus for first strike, half their strength. So again, 18 damage on that charge. That's a whole heck of a lot of them hitting that first 18 damage charge. We might not want to take this province until we have the higher armored hoplites down here. These guys only do 14, not a problem. Archers only do 11, not a problem. Get out of here. Take a look at our other battle in Raphabolia. Let's see how it went. Let's see if it goes the exact way we thought it would. Speed up the battle. Word of power, somebody. Word of power. Archers aren't doing much to us. They're hitting our 11 protection guys a little bit, but that's it. We form a little wall. This is excellent. Excellent. Looks easy. And we have routed them. We lost five of our low protection troops, which we are, again, okay with. Plenty of kills across the board. Very comfortable. Unexpected event. Misfortune three. Oh boy, lucky us. Let's go to that province. And remember, hit D to choose province defense. One, two, three, four, five. Or shift up. And there you go. You've got six province defense here. And now our income of 107 is boosted by this province. That's why we fight for farms early. This province is a little tough for us, again. So what we might do is we might, in terms of efficiency, simply go here to fight because Heavy infantry's 13 damage, archers 11 damage, and militia's 13 damage are not going to cause us much of a threat. Now, our archer here can confirm something, but at this point, I want the archer to just roam. Actually, we'll roam over to Bountiful Land because it's, again, another farmland. Lots of money. We like lots of money. Hit R or click up here to recruit. Check what we've got coming in. Same true resource allotment. Same gold, 384. So we'll still stick with the Geront. And now what we'll do is we'll check our army status. Remember, up here, army setup T. And we will put all of these gentlemen on one of the Geront. Put the Geront up front. Have him bless himself and do whatever he wants after that. Cast spells. Put these gentlemen out here. If you look at them, they can fight in sparse line formation. I really don't want our commander to get hit by them or any troops sneaking around the outside. So we'll put them up here. Put them on hold and attack. Shift C closest. Send this guy out here to handle these gentlemen. Now we could fight these gentlemen, but they have a lot more archers. These guys don't have any archers, so it makes our commander a little safer. And I really want the resources of the adjacent provinces of what's called our cap circle. The provinces circling our capital city because we draw, our home province draws resources from these provinces. Hit E for end turn. Here we go on our next turn. We lost some crippled units during walking between provinces. If you have any units with broken legs, we leave them behind and they die. This is Sparta after all, so just, you know, leave the weak behind. Battle of Sinextro. I'm sorry, Nashin is one and Sinextro is the next. Let's take a look at how the battle goes. We're looking around. Same troops. This should go fairly simply. We already know how this one's set up. We already know that they don't really have the capability of hurting anybody except our 11 protection at Dromos, which is a perfect example right here. Just using them as extra bodies. Everybody else is virtually invulnerable to them. See? Excellent. We only lost the low protection troops. Nashin. Let's see how our new expansion army did. Let's speed it up. He blessed himself. Now see, the reason I'm nervous about archers is this gentleman's protection is only four. He has a good 30 HP, but his protection is only four. So I really don't like him getting lit up by random archer fire. There we go. He's launching fire everywhere, which makes me a little nervous with early game, but we're good to go. Didn't lose a single troop. D for province defense, shift up. We get ourselves six. That's important to get that. However, I don't, I want the ability to recruit a Cyclops this turn. So I'm going to hold off on putting defense all the way up to six on this one. I lied. I made it. And now we have two expansion armies, heavy infantry and slingers, militias, heavy cavalries and light cavalries, Jaguar tribe slingers and Jaguar tribe warriors. We can go here for heavy infantry and slingers. They're a little slower, or we can go here 
here for Jaguar Tribe. I like the resources, so I'm willing to go here, try this out. This is risky. Be careful, because again, sometimes they have a necromancer or some random troop there. But I want my cap circle filled in, so we're going to try this battle out. Looking over here, look around. Militias, light cavalries, heavy cavalries, heavy infantry, militia, and light infantry, and a throne. Heavy infantry, militia, and light infantry looks like they can't do anything to us, so let's go that way. And it's a highlands, so it's high resources. Nice little spot. This one is plains and river. Ooh, that's high income. That's tough. We could try this out. Let's go for it. Go back to our base. Hit R for recruit. Make sure we're getting the commander. We're getting more of these troops, and you can see we're starting to get more resources. So eventually we'll be able to start recruiting the hoplites so that we're better against player-led armies. But we're still only on turn five, so let's see how it happens. Here we go, turn six. Ultima Delica. Let's see what happens. Heavy cavalry. Now these are the guys you want to watch out for because they have higher protection and defense. They have a lance that you'll notice it says heavy weapon. They add their full strength to this instead of half, so they add an extra 10 damage. So this is a 26 damage lance charge, which is why it's good that we still have these guys catching the lances. So we'll see how well this goes. These guys should have archer, yeah, bows with low precision, so we're not too concerned. See what happens. There they go. They took the lance charge for us, and now we're here to wipe them out. Excellent. And now our hoplites are virtually impenetrable by any of these weapons. We lost two of our weaker troops, which we expected. We lost four of our more heavily armored troops to those lance charges, but we're okay with that. Rot Marsh. Let's see this fight over here in the swamps. And a mage with a gem. That's what I'm always nervous about in these provinces. Let's see how this goes. Cast Blessing. He'll start trying to light people on fire, I'm guessing. Oh, I guess he's just sitting there. Yep, looks like we're just going to thump our way through their low damage slings and take them out. There we go. We lost one troop. Not bad. Unexpected event in Macon. Oh, here they go. This is the once a year declaring war on our population, so we're going to have less gold this turn. We got a glamour gem and some nature gems and curse of our troops. Okay, random events. Who cares? Now we have our troops. If you hit T left to right, you have enough guys for another expansion army, so we can do this. This guy has earth, which makes him much better at protecting himself than the average person. Cast a spell. Let's bless ourselves and then cast spells. Put ourselves a little bit forward. Put these guys up here on sparse line formation. Hold and attack closest. How soon until we get the ability to buff armors? There we go. Temper armors coming up soon. Very, very shortly. We have 31 research per month. 26 to go. So we're going to get it this turn. Have this gentleman go this way to get the deer tribe warriors and archers. Have this gentleman go, let's say, militias, heavy cav, and light cav. Militias and light cav. Let's go to the light cav. We won't be able to get hit by the damage of the light cavalry. Make sure we're recruiting the appropriate troops. Yep, we're getting a Cyclops next turn. Now that we have a bunch of these, I like to check again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're now getting seven of these. Four. One, two, three, four, five. Nope, we're still only getting four. So stick with the seven. Wait, actually, question mark to see your commands. And you can restore recruitment to start of turn state with X. Hit that, and we get the advantage of the resources we saved up from last turn. Hit N, the letter N, as in Nancy, to get to our next hero. Here's our scout. What does he see here? Heavy infantries and slingers. Excellent. We like that. We can take that with our expanding hero here to get this next turn. Go over here where our next guy is or hit N to find him. We want to, another trick to look is hit F1 if you're ever unsure. You can see your defense of all your provinces here. We want six in every province. So click, shift up, click, shift up. And now you have six to re prevent those negative events. Now we're here, we're injured, we're looking weak. One good thing would be normally make our way back towards base to get troops, or we can just wait for somebody to bring us some troops. I will find some easy provinces to target. Heavy infantry, militias, and light infantry. Amazons and Jade Maidens are never easy. Militias, light infantries, and archers. That's easy. Let's do it. All right, come in here. Make sure we're recruiting. We're good to go. And we're set. And now next turn, we should be reducing our unrest from 34 back down so we can actually get some darn income again. And then we'll be able to see what's going on with all of our high income provinces. Let's check it out. All right, here we go. I think it's turn six or seven. Check out the battle in Pannonia. See how we did against all these light cavalry and everything else. Kept our mage protected well enough. Did enough damage. Yep, there we go. We're starting to route them. And the advantage, too, of an 18 morale from our squad morale bonus because of our bless that we took, the inspirational plus two, is that these guys can virtually fight any number of unfair troop advantages, and they fight their way right through it. Lost nothing, of course. Let's check Forbidden Fields. This one was the more questionable one because we don't have many troops left. Oh, this is an easy fight. Militias and archers. 
As long as we don't morale route from an unlucky roll, we should be good to go. There we go. We lost one of the lower armored ones again. We expect that. And now Anasia. Now, if you take a look at these deer tribe, they don't do a lot of damage, but they have javelins, which hurts lower, lightly armored troops, but not us. Now, this person could have a gem, but nothing too bad. He's just going to summon a couple trees. whole lot of trees, but these things are not going to cause us too many problems. 20 hit points. We're okay with that. Tire yourself out, sir. Thank you. There we go. Perfect combat. New event. Here we go. We killed our own unrest. Killed the population along with it. Handful of water gems. Handful of earth gems. We like gems. Hit F1. Find all of our one defense provinces. Shift up. Shift up. Shift up. Now let's go left to right. Go to our home province. Army setup. We only have seven, so let's wait another turn. We now have an Elder Cyclops with water access. My least favorite access for him to pull. And now he can forge water items, which is good for us. Gives us a couple more options of like Rings of Frost and similar things. He could forge pretty much any of this stuff, but we're waiting for those Dwarven Hammers to be able to capitalize. Let's check our recruitment. Let's recruit another one of these Cyclops. I would even go so far as hitting repeat recruitment just so I keep them coming. These are great to have to as leaders if you really want them, but or Archons are good for spells because they have a really good set of battle paths. But I like getting the Cyclops because they can do both jobs. Now, we have enough resources that we can start cranking out quite a few. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. No, we can get five, though, per turn instead of seven of these guys. That's something to consider. I would do this in a multiplayer game. I would start getting five of these. I wouldn't even slip that in there. Start getting five of these a turn because now we already have seven plus five. That gives us our nice 12 that we like. And then next turn after... Problem is we're not surrounded by a lot of resources, but every time we get another one of these guys, we get... 25 more resources per turn. So that's five extra troops instead of seven. It's two less troops per turn. Depends on the numbers and depends what you're facing. But I personally would switch over to hoplites now so I ha don't have to worry about it nearly as much. And then I would put an extra two hoplites on there just so that when the resources climb, I will start getting an extra one every other turn. Take a look at our, here's our expansion army. 12 of the Ectromos. Let's send these guys out. 100 units, heavy infantry and slingers or 30 units. Well, 100 infantry slingers, might as well give it a shot. Send our scout over this way. Check over the river. Why not? Down here. This has a great income of this plains province. Look at this. Another farm. But light cavalry and cataphracts. Those can be tough. Heavy cavalry, militia, and light cavalry. That can be tough. Light infantry, archers, and militias. We can try that out. Hit N to make sure there are a troop is. There he is. He's still looking okay. We could even go so far as combining these troops so that they don't HP route if any of them die. And then we can look around for easy provinces to pick off. Bear tribe warriors are not easy. Heavy, 120 heavy infantry is not very easy. Barbarians, definitely not. Light cavalries and heavy Heavy cavalry's not. Amazon's jade maidens. Hmm. Let's go to the heavy infantries and slingers here, and let's hope that there's less than it says. We are again on turn seven. That way we can go here, they can go here, and then we can hopefully go here and get some troops, but it won't be possible to cross the river. How is our research coming along? We did not get construction because we sent somebody out to fight. Whoops. We'll get it this turn. Here we are, turn eight, I believe it is. We finished construction, so we got access to temper armors, which is great. Bountiful lands. Let's see what happens. Not too risky. They only do 13 damage and 10 damage. Let's just blast through this replay as long as nothing crazy happens. Yep, should be good to go. Good luck, Slingers. Perfect. Eagle Reach Mountains. Let's go see what happened over here. Oh yeah, this one's going to be easy as long as they don't target the commander. Good to go. Excellent. No losses. Elk Land. All right, this is our Prophet. Hold on to life, Prophet. Let's go with your last remaining troops. Get them. Ooh, the Hoplite's getting through is a good thing as long as these guys hold up. Yep. Excellent. Okay, now we're getting to the point where our prophet gentleman needs to be very cautious. Unexpected event in Macone. Cryption ended. Bloodshed is over for the year. An exceptional Cryptus was elected and rewarded. This is where we get our assassin for free. Air gems. Three hoplites promoted in Elkland. Excellent. The hoplites got promoted up to these Neata mode hoplites, and they are much stronger than the hoplites they start as. Very, very good morale. Very powerful. So that is a big benefit for us. However, we are at the point where we don't want to expand with this gentleman anymore. That being said, this is kind of a good spot to set up a fort or something similar because the population and the income is insane with the fort, forest, and the river here. Let's take a look. Hit F1. Check all our provinces. Make sure they have six defense. If you're like me and you hate random events taking your provinces, come over here. Let's see what we're doing with money first. Let's go to base. Here's our assassin. He got legendary cruelty, which is amazing for an assassin. Everyone fears him, blah, 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 but he gets fear. That is huge on an assassin. I put him on patrol. I'm just weird. You could also send him out to assassinate people, but with his low protection, I wouldn't do it. He's not a very patient gentleman, so he doesn't 
doesn't really eliminate a lot of bodyguards protections and must on him find where we want to go with this guy actually i'm not going to focus so much on expansion you can see we are only on turn eight and we already have three expansion parties and this turn it'll turn into four and we will just continue expanding expanding we already have one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen thirteen provinces on turn eight i just wanted to wait through this little expansion because i know i'm taking a lot of time on on this more beginner beginner friendly i just wanted you guys to see the events now our unrest got dropped back down but as you can see the unrest is still up if you look carefully at the description of this forts increase unrest non-stop that is why i primarily like having these guys patrol just to bring my unrest down to begin with naturally the income loss is lost before you patrol so it's kind of a permanent income downgrade but at the very least this minimizes it these guys don't have terrible patrol strength 18 is pretty good for a single unit and you get one of these guys per fort per year free so might as well put them up and they only cost 88 a year so put them up in patrol make yourselves back that money until you need to put items on them and have them go cut someone in half and now i'm not gonna again i'm not gonna continue expanding you could easily get 30 provinces of expansion with this and the beautiful thing is as long as all your armies start looking like this you can take over entire games and win them with just hordes of these gentlemen now you can build seven per turn of these guys in your home province and these guys in your other castles for example here build another one where's a good income province here's another great income province i would build a castle at here's another great income province i would build a cast a fort at here's another great income province that i might build a fort at just because of the gold if you build four and another one right here build fort 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 now you're cranking out three 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 so you've got an extra 12 maybe even 15 of those hoplites that you're cranking out yes you're suffering unrest however you don't care because you're pumping out so many hoplites that you're slaughtering entire provinces and nations with just your hoplites running around give it a shot guys it was a much more beginner friendly video wanted you guys to be able to poke through and enjoy it and this i'm hoping some of the very 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 brand new players out there can now pick up makona and try to make sparta a comeback in dominion 6 catch you guys on the next one